PID, Pelvic Inflammatory Disease. Hello, this is Dr. Maha from Madela's Medical Videos and Podcast. So today's case is a 25 years old, Nulli Gravida, presents to the emergency department with bilateral lower abdominal pelvic pain. The onset was 24 hours ago, after she had just finished her menstrual period. She is sexually active but using no contraception. Speculum examination reveals mucopurulent cervical discharge. Bimanual pelvic examination shows bilateral adenexal tenderness and cervical motion tenderness. She is afebrile at the moment. Qualitative urinary beta-HCG test is negative. Complete blood cell count shows WBC 14,000 ESR is elevated. Focusing on the history and examination, we see that there is bilateral abdominal pelvic pain, a mucopurulent cervical discharge, and cervical motion tenderness on examination. So the differential diagnosis of this case could be pelvic inflammatory disease, adenexal torsion, ectopic pregnancy, endometriosis, appendicitis, diverticulitis, Crohn's disease, and ulcerative colitis. So today's case is pelvic inflammatory disease, that is PID. Now PID is a non-specific term for a spectrum of upper genital tract conditions, ranging from acute bacterial infection to massive adhesions from old inflammatory scarring. The commonest cause is sexually transmitted diseases such as gonorrhea and chlamydia. Less common causes include direct extension from the pendicular, diverticular, or post-surgical abscesses that rupture into the pelvis. Post-delivery or post-abortion complications may also be a cause. Hematogenous spread is rare, but it can occur in tuberculosis. Another very important cause is the presence of an IUCD, that is intrauterine contraceptive device. This increases the risk of PID. Now, typically, PID spreads along the mucous membranes by ascent from the vulva, the cervix, the endometrium, to the adenexa and the fallopian tubes. Now, if we leave it untreated, of course, the course of the infection would progress. That is endometritis, that is the inflammation of the inner lining of the uterus. Salpingitis, that is the inflammation of the tubes. Eventually, it could lead to pyosalpings or even tubo-ovarian or pelvic abscess. Chronic PIDs can also be seen if it is not appropriately treated. The body's immune defenses will often overcome the infection at the expense of persistent adhesions and scarring. What happens with tubo ovarian abscess is that the body's immune defenses cannot overcome the infection. The process worsens, producing an inflammatory mass involving the oviducts, the ovaries, uterus, bowel, and even the omentum. Now, coming to the sonographic findings of PID. Obviously, at the beginning of the disease, we wouldn't be able to see all these uh, clear findings through the ultrasound, but with time, we could actually find signs of endometritis, that is, thick endometrium with fluid around. Fluid in the cul-de-sac mostly with debris, that is pus. Periovarium inflammation, enlarged ovaries with multiple cysts and indistinct margins. Pyosalpings or hydrosalpings, that is fluid-filled dilated tubes, appear as cystic tubular masses with echogenic walls. 
These are to be distinguished from fluid-filled dilated bowel loops by the lack of peristalsis. A thickened tubular wall that is 5 millimeters or more indicates an acute disease. Now, as the infection worsens, periovarian adhesions may form with the fusion of an inflamed dilated tube and ovary. This is called tubo-ovarian complex, and this can be seen with ultrasound. Now, furthermore, further progression of infection results in a complex multiloculated mass with irregular margins and scattered internal echoes. This is labeled as tubo-ovarian abscess. Now, what can I find as an ultrasound finding with chronic PID? In chronic PID, extensive fibrosis and adhesion obscure the margins of pelvic organs, resulting in a large ill-defined mass. Now, let me make it simpler. So the infection basically starts with the cervix, okay? So it's called cervicitis. And from here, uh, the infection would ascend. It would go to the endometrium, that is the uterine lining, and ascending eventually to cause an acute salpingoophoritis. So here the patient is usually symptomatic. And often a patient would go to the doctor and get the treatment. If the patient gets the proper treatment, it will heal without adhesions and returns to its and the pelvis eventually returns to its normal state. But if the patient doesn't get treatment, it will either heal with adhesions, and that is called chronic PID. Or in some cases, it will not heal and eventually get worse to form a tubo-ovarian abscess, which is an accumulation of pus in the adenexia, forming an inflammatory mass involving the oviducts, ovaries, uterus, and omentum, as I've mentioned before. So the symptoms of this patient suffering from this condition is that, first of all, patient would look septic. The patient would come with lower abdominal pelvic pain, which is severe. Often the patient has severe back pain, rectal pain, pain with the bowel movements. Nausea and vomiting are present. Now by examination, the patient will appear very sick. Now she has a high fever with tachycardia. She may be uh, suffering from septic shock. Uh, having hypotension, abdominal examination shows peritoneal signs and guarding and rigidity. Now, pelvic examination may show such severe pain that a rectal examination must be performed. Bilateral adenexal masses may be palpated. Uh, by investigations, uh, what findings can we find? Now, uh, cervical cultures are usually positive for chlamydia or gonorrhea. The blood culture may be positive for gram-negative bacteria, anaerobic organisms. Caldicentesis may yield pus. WBC and ESR are markedly elevated. The sonography or CT scan will show the bilateral complex pelvic masses. But obviously, we should also keep in mind that um, there are other differential diagnoses that come with similar um, findings that is septic shock, diverticular or appendical abscess, and adenexal torsion. Now, in such conditions, the patient would be admitted and given IV clindamycin and gentamicin. They might need also laparotomy and maybe surgeries. Whereas if the patient with chronic PID uh, usually suffers from lower abdominal pelvic pain, um, varying from minimal to severe. Other symptoms may include um, history of infertility, dyspareunia, topic pregnancy, abnormal vaginal bleeding. Interestingly, uh, what could be found uh, through investigative findings? The cervical cultures are negative. WBCs, ESR are normal. 
whereas sonography may show bilateral cystic pelvic masses consistent with hydrosalpinges. So usually uh, the diagnosis of chronic PID is based on laparoscopic visualization of pelvic adhesions, whereas the management would be an outpatient, uh, mild analgesics can be given for pain, whereas lysis of tubal adhesions may be helpful in cases of for infertility. Severe unremitting pelvic pain may require a pelvic clean-out. If the ovaries are removed, estrogen replacement therapy is indicated. So uh, what we understood here from the whole case scenario of PID is the is that the sooner we catch the disease, the better is the consequence. That is, if we diagnose the condition uh, very early uh, before it ascends and involves other uh, parts of the genital tract and progresses into tubal ovarian abscess or it causes adhesions, all these um, severe complications, is to start the management as soon as possible. That is, usually management is often based on presumptive diagnosis. Empiric broad spectrum coverage need to include the gonorrhea and the chlamydia as well as the anaerobes. So best thing is to start giving the medication soon after the diagnosis is done, which should be done really early. With the help of clinical findings, as well as the blood tests and ultrasound. Thank you so much and see you in another episode. Mm -hmm.